Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Almost every day as a new Trump embarrassment emerges from the White House, people ask, how did this happen? Millions of words have now been written about the current state of our politics, our country, and our civic discourse, about the anger that abounds. Every publication, every cable channel, every journalist who covers politics, and many that don't, have opined on how we got here. There are as many theories as there are journalists, pundits, professors, and consultants. How did 8 million voters who voted for Obama twice become Trump voters? How did the political class miss what was going on among the group that Hillary Clinton called the basket of deplorables? And Obama talked of how they cling to guns or religion or antipathy towards people who aren't like them. Indeed, two years later, we're still trying to understand all this. We're going to take another deep dive into the Trump voters today with my guest, Ben Bradley Jr. He's the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Kid, and he spent 25 years with the Boston Globe as a reporter and editor. As the deputy managing editor of the Globe, he oversaw the Globe's Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of the sexual assault scandal in the Catholic Church. And it is my pleasure to welcome Ben Bradley Jr. here to talk about his new book, The Forgotten, how the people of one Pennsylvania county elected Donald Trump and changed America. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Tell us about this county. Where in Pennsylvania did you go? This is northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, Wilkes-Barre is the county seat. And, uh, you know, like many journalists, I was uh, shocked that a candidate as unusual as Donald Trump uh, got elected president and was looking for um, a different way into telling the story. And Going over the election results, especially in the three swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which decided the election, I found this, I noticed this one county, uh, Luzerne County in um, northeast Pennsylvania, um, which uh, is is a traditionally Democratic county and had gone for, hadn't voted for a Republican for president since 1988, George Bush Sr., and had voted for Obama twice, but surged in the other direction for Donald Trump. Trump piled up such a margin there that in Luzerne uh, Luzerne County served as 60% of his victory margin for the state of Pennsylvania. So without this one county, he wouldn't have won the state or perhaps the presidency to the extent Pennsylvania's demographics are similar to Michigan's and Wisconsin. So I went down there uh, less than a month after the election and began poking around wanting to talk to Trump voters, uh, hoping to use this county as a prism uh, to do a deep dive into the Trump vote. I think the premise of the book is that is that more than half the country remains shocked uh, that Trump won and that there's a hunger to know a little bit more about why. As you went down there and you started talking to voters and you interviewed uh, 100 plus people down there, what were some of the common themes that started to emerge as you had these conversations? Well, they felt um, isolated from the rest of the country. They felt uh, marginalized by flat or uh, falling wages. Uh, changing demographics made them feel like strangers in their own land. This county had a uh, influx of uh, Hispanics, mostly Dominicans, uh, coming from New York and New Jersey looking for lower cost housing. They felt that others were cutting in line, as it were, uh, taking too much money from the government. Or, and from and from them, taxpayers, um, and they felt a loss of dignity. I think they felt that you know they say people fall in love with their therapists because they want to be heard without judgment, and they felt heard by Trump, um, and they felt that uh, Hillary did not hear them, especially when she called them deplorables. Not only did she not seem to hear them, but there was a sense that they were being embarrassed, that they were being put down somehow. Talk about that. Yes. Yes. Well, they feel feel, uh, dominated by uh, a liberal culture uh, that that mocks their 
their faith and their patriotism. They resented that. They resented that. They felt that, that Trump made them feel good about themselves and that Hillary made them feel ashamed. So they went for Trump. That was the bottom line. One of the other points you make is that even those that, that realized that they were voting arguably against their own economic interests were just interested in shaking things up. Talk about that. Right. Well, Trump's policies as president uh, have not always been in his supporters' economic interests. They point to things that they that they like, um, like Trump's being able to get uh, two conservative uh, Supreme Court justices on the high court and uh, the, and the tax cut. They certainly like, but. Uh, um, other things that Trump promised during the campaign, he hasn't delivered on. Um, for example, he promised to, to repeal and replace Obamacare, but he's not. Uh, that's not happened. He did repeal the individual mandate, but he's tried to sabotage what's left of the uh, program, and that hurts his constituency. He promised to eliminate the national debt in eight years, but the budget he filed in February will add seven trillion dollars to the debt over the next dec decade. And he campaigned on the high costs of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and said the the uh, money could be better used at home. You know, the America First doctrine, if you will. Mm -hmm. But his budget increased defense spending by nearly two hundred billion dollars. And while he had promised to uh, level fund or increase spending for entitlements like Medicare and Medicaid, his budget for 2018 uh, cut about $500 billion from both programs. So it hasn't really been, so far, this administration has not served the economic interest of his base, but they love him anyway. They love his feistiness. They love how he gets up in the morning and uh, gives everybody hell on Twitter and how he sticks it to the uh, elites each and every day. I mean, one of the things that becomes clearer and clearer in this, in, in these interviews that, that you've done for The Forgotten, is how much the cultural issues are really what it was about for so many of these people. Yes, you're right. You're right. I, I think that uh, culture trumps economics. I think in order to vote for someone, you have to have a comfort level with them. You have to like the candidate that you're voting for. And that that's more important in the final analysis than whether you agree with him on a, on a range of issues. Like these people will, will often disagree with him on, on some things. But the bottom line is they just like him. And they're willing to uh, stay with him through thick and thin. I found Trump's famous quote, you remember, from the campaign about he could be on Fifth Avenue and right. shoot somebody and, and still not lose any voters. Remember that one? Yes, sure. And uh, these people that I talk to in, in um, this county in Pennsylvania are, are very much of that stripe. Um, I interviewed 100 odd people, but for the book, I chose to focus on 12 people. Um, who represented different slices of the Trump constituency and whose stories I thought were compelling um, and who were able to tell their own stories well. And of those 12, um, as of today, 11 of them say that if the election were to be held uh, tomorrow, the 2020 election, they would enthusiastically vote for Trump again. And only one of the 12 has slipped into the undecided category. One of the other groups you talk to, and you, you delineate this in the book, is women that supported Trump. And, and, you know, the comment was made about a week or two ago that, particularly in the, at the height of the Kavanaugh hearings, that women supporting Trump is a little like chickens investing in Colonel Sanders. And yet women are still <laughs> supporting him. Yeah, they, again, they just like him. They, they were able, they were willing, uh, more than willing to give him a pass on the Access Hollywood tape, uh, the allegations from uh, 18 named women during the campaign who said that Trump uh, sexually harassed them over the years. 
Um, they just they 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 bought his explanation that that was um, that well that the Access Hollywood tape was just locker room talk. Uh, boys will be boys, and they hasten to add that girls will be girls too. They say those kind of things. I, I was told. So um, again, it, they they overall they had a comfort level with with him, and they resented it, any notion that they were as women they were expected to vote for Hillary merely because she was a woman. Did you come away, Ben, with a greater sense, I, I certainly did in, in, in reading the comments of so many of these people, that it really is, to use you know the John Edwards phrase, two Americas, and that because the cultural issues lie at the core of this, and the, the economic reasons and, and the, the, the things that drive these cultural issues are certainly not going back into the proverbial bottle, that it, it's almost irreconcilable, these two Americas. Perhaps, but I did find people um, depressed at the polarized state of our country and yearning for some dialogue. And that made me wonder if there isn't uh, hay to be made politically for some Democrat in 2020 who could run on more of a unity platform. You know, Trump, when he, in his victory speech on election night, uh, did pledge to reach out to the to the rest of America, to the to the to Hillary's America, if you will. But he, as president, he's done nothing of the sort. He's he's behaved mostly as president of his base, rather than president of the country. And I think it's a, one of the president's jobs is to try and unify the country. And um, he's the, Trump is the first politician that I've seen who doesn't seem interested in expanding his base, which would seem to be a curious uh, re-election strategy. But we have to remember that Trump and um, George W. Bush, two of our last three presidents, have been elected without winning the popular vote. So you don't need to get to 50 percent anymore. You can win with a strong plurality. And that seems to be Trump's re-election strategy, perhaps banking on a credible third party candidate entering the race to further divide the vote. But even if that doesn't happen, if you look at the total percentages, of, if you look at the total percentage of the vote that the Libertarians and the Green parties won, in 2016, it was 5%, which is more than enough to make the difference. Of course, that is also a strategy to further divide the country and a strategy that, that makes these differences all the more, all the wider than uh, they might have been otherwise. Right. Well, that's why, that's what I meant when I said I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that Trump um, – doesn't seem interested in expanding his constituency. I mean, what what previous politician has not been interested in, in broadening his constituency? And that's why I, I, I think that um, I think the Democrats, in order to to um, to win in 2020, can't simply double down on. Um, Hillary's strategy, which was essentially to replicate the Obama coalition with uh, minorities, uh, women, etc. Um, I, I don't think that they can ignore the white working class, uh, who used to be faithful members of the, of the Democratic Party. A lot of the people that I talked to um, say that they didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left them. And I think it will take somebody with uh, more blue collar cred, if you will, and then Hillary to win some of these people back. They, they want to feel listened to. They want to feel heard. Of course, the argument on the other side within the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party needs to do the same thing, the same thing that the Republicans have done and appeal only to its, its base, move further to the left and just increase turnout. Yeah, I'm aware of the argument, but I think 
if they nominate, if the Democrats nominate Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, or, or Kamala Harris, or someone of that ilk, um, they're going to lose because it's largely a center-right country, and uh, that that far-left liberal philosophy, I don't think it's going to fly in the heartland, Jeff. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is, as you touched on before, how difficult it is, given the Electoral College, essentially, for Democrats to win, even if they win the popular vote. Right. Well, Trump, uh, I think, had a had a fair point on that. Uh, you know, if you take out New York and California, uh, those are the, roughly the three million votes that Hillary won by. Um, and the system is the system, and you have to run accordingly. Trump probably would have run a different race if he w uh, wasn't following the Electoral College rules. And um, in order to get, in order to eliminate the Electoral College, uh, that would take a constitutional amendment, and I don't think that's going to happen right. anytime soon. As you talk to these voters in Pennsylvania, what would it take for them? To, what do you think that it would take for them to abandon Trump at this point? Well, I think it would take a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just like him. I mean, one one variable might be uh, whatever Robert Mueller comes up with in the Russia investigation. If there's a if there's a smoking gun there, uh, I think even the Trump base will uh, be forced to reevaluate. Even though for now they they um, simply repeat his uh, mantra that there was no collusion and that it's all a hoax. Uh, but if Mueller comes up with hard evidence, and no one knows what he has, and no one knows the timetable of when these findings are going to be released. But the way things seem to be moving, it, 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 he'll release his findings early next year. And if they're compelling enough, uh, I think that's the one thing that could get them, uh, could, could get the Trump base to uh, reevaluate. But he's got a solid core with them, and uh, he tends to them all the time with his tweets and with his uh, election rallies only in his favored red states. How would you describe these voters in terms of, of their knowledge? I mean, are they low-information voters, high-information voters? How would you classify them in that regard? Well, I think they're relatively high information voters, um, but listening to right wing media primarily. You know, we live in in uh, an age of media silos now, don't we? People tend to only uh, listen to, read, or watch the media that they agree with, and this people are, are serving as their own editors. So this is serving to uh, only polarize the country further. And it's gotten to the point where uh, Trump has actually created an, his own alternate reality. You know, he attacks the press, uh, calls it fake news. Of course, the, the, the phrase fake news uh, really only means stories that he doesn't agree with. It's not that they're fake or not true. And the Washington Post has, has documented more than 5,000 false or misleading statements that Trump has made since becoming president, which is more than eight a day. And that's incredible when you stop to think of it. But when the errors are pointed out, the Trump base doesn't believe them because they're pointed out, um, they say, with liberal bias. So I think we're in a hell of a fix now. Um, because we can't agree on what a fact is even anymore. Uh, in Kellyanne Conway's famous phrase, there are now alternative facts to consider as well. Is there a sense among the people that you talk to in Pennsylvania that things are not going back the way they used to be, that, that no matter what Trump says and no matter what may happen in the short, short term, coal isn't coming back? immigration mm -hmm. isn't going to stop, 
that the technology is changing the workplace, that all of the things that have created dislocation and uneasiness and anger in a lot of cases, that, that these genies are out of the bottle and that it's not going to change. Is there that realization? I think there is uh, in their gut. and They, they do realize that. Uh, certainly they know uh, coal is dead. Uh, clean coal is, is probably, uh, um, you know, just a, a slogan uh, without, without meaning. They realize that their county um, doesn't have much economic opportunity or hope, and that's why young people are leaving the county in droves and there's a, there's a brain drain. And that's been going on for generations. Still, they have hope. And uh, Trump gave them hope. As one uh, local politician down there said to me that Obama had hope and change, but Trump had knocked down the door and change. And these voters were in a mood to uh, turn over the table and break some China. Uh, without really knowing what was going to happen uh, after Trump did that. They were willing to take a chance on him, and uh, the jury's still out. But yet even two years into it, with all that we have seen, with all those uh, misstatements and everything else, as you say, most of them are still with him. Yep. It, it's it's incredible. Uh, I mean, this is why I, I think Trump is is uh, you know the most interesting candidate we've seen in in generations. Uh, I mean, this guy said and did things along the way in the campaign that would have destroyed any other candidate, but he just kept going. And um, uh, people people liked his style. They felt that there was. Uh, media bias that remains a big sticking point and uh, we do seem to live in in uh, two different realities here is it your sense that trump merely exploited these attitudes and these sentiments that were, were deeply ingrained in places like this count luzerne county in pennsylvania or that he created some of that anxiety? I think he exploited uh, both, really. I think he, he uh, exploited and uh, weaponized long festering resentments, but also um, added to them. I mean, let's face it, the country was divided mm -hmm. before Trump, but it's become more divided since then. Um, by some of the uh, controversial things that uh, that he said. Don't forget, he he rose to prominence in the Republican Party on the strength on the on the heels of the birther movement. Uh, he said Obama was not a citizen and um, questioned his uh, birth certificate and, and 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 you know in the face of uh, obvious reality. But that was something uh, that his base loved to hear. And he didn't take it back uh, until um, way late in the campaign, uh, and only with a with a gun to his head, but never apologized. Mm -hmm. So um, there are these two different um, strains, and uh, Trump, while he did exploit and fan existing resentments uh he's added to them also in his in his uh you know he's he's hasn't been hesitant to um linger on political third rails like race misogyny and um and he's gotten away with it and finally ben what did you learn about those voters that were obama voters some of them obama voters twice that became trump voters well, as this fellow said, that uh, Obama had hope and change, and these people had knocked down the door and change. I, I just feel that they grew more and more frustrated with Obama. There's also, you know, a tendency in this in this country, you get sick of your president after eight years, and you want to change. Uh, but with with Obama, I think there was a um, 
a subtle racism that began to emerge. They kept they kept telling me these voters that that they loved how politically incorrect Trump was, and that as a society were paralyzed by political correctness. These are tropes uh, to some extent. But one important thing that Trump has done, I think, is to speak in such a raw and different way as to give his base permission to speak in the same way. And they felt they felt liberated in doing that. Every, everything from you know being able to say uh, Merry Christmas to um, speaking about immigrants uh, in a in a raw and previously unacceptable way. Did you come away pretty pessimistic about the future of the country from this exercise? Actually, not. You know, I I mean, I come from uh, Boston and, and Massachusetts, a blue state, and I think we live in bubbles in this country, and there, there's a, a need to know much more about our fellow Americans. And I learned a lot in going down to uh, this county in Pennsylvania and, and using it as a as a prism the way I did, and. Um, they were a little suspicious of me I initially, thinking that that uh, I was probably liberal. And um, but you know, you gain their trust, you listen, and and you learn a lot. And despite the degree of polarization, I, I did sense from them that they were hungry to talk again to the to the other side uh, but didn't really quite know how to go about it and i'm sort of hoping that this book um, might be a bridge to help bring people together a bit more again ben bradley jr the book is the forgotten how the people of one pennsylvania county elected donald trump and changed america ben i thank you so much for spending time with us thanks jeff enjoyed it thank you